Hello, my name is Sean, and I'd like to welcome you to A Theology of Christian Permaculture, where we attempt to synthesize permaculture, agricultural, ecological, and other principles through the lens of scriptures. The first question we may ask is, why do we need a theology of Christian permaculture? And that is a very good question. And there are eight basic ideas, maybe not answers or exact reasons, but I just want to give you eight basic ideas as to why we as Christians should think about ecology, uh, agriculture, and how it can be sustainable, caring and stewarding our planet, and even the use of permaculture principles in doing these things. Now, first of all, it is obvious that the Bible is written within a agricultural or an agrarian context. Many of our favorite Bible stories such as Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down by green pastures next to still waters. All those are, you know, pastoral, animal husbandry. Then there are the passages like in Jeremiah where God says to Jeremiah, what do you see? He says, I see a blooming almond branch. And God says, you see rightly, for I am watching waiting for my word to bloom. Then there are the Levitical or the, you know, the laws of Deuteronomy with the grain offerings or as is shown in the book of Ruth, the law of cleaning the edges of the field in order that widows and orphans could be provided for. Then we think about Jesus as well. Jesus used parables that were set in these type of settings. Even the Sermon on the Mount is in this beautiful pastoral setting set against the lake. But we have the parable of the fig tree, the parable of the sower. We have the, the parable of the birds of the tree. And then even, uh, you know, Paul talks about this whole idea of the victor's crown, which could have been made out of amaranth leaves in some cases and others. It would have been out of olive branches and olive leaves. So we see that there is a very important place given in Scripture to ecological, agricultural principles, describing them, and using them. And the beautiful thing, too, is that most of them have a application which we can apply to our lives to help us live lives that would reflect the glory of God and of Christ. Now, the second reason, or second idea is, in Psalm 24, 1, it says, The earth is the Lord, the fullness thereof, all that is in it is his. You see, the earth and everything was created by God, and it is essentially a reflection of his character and nature. It is an expression of his creativity. When we look at the world around us, like, Hear the birds, that bird right there. We hear a few different birds. Then we have the squirrels, we have the trees, we have the different types of flowers, the different types of plants. The way that God even created people to be different. So we need to form a theology of Christian agriculture, Christian ecology, Christian permaculture, because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Now, there is also the commission of Adam, number three, commission of Adam, number three, in Genesis chapter one and two, in which he is told to tend the garden. In this narrative, we see that there are many different aspects that take place where Adam is interacting with the animals. He's naming them. He also is to tend and care for, steward the garden or the land around him. He interacts with human to human companionship with Eve. And then he also fellowships with God on a consistent basis. And Genesis 126 talks about how God gives this mandate or this commission to Adam to not only just fill the earth, but 
the one of the words is, is that is used is to subdue. We're going to look at a later time as to what that word subdue and also the word dominion in these passages may actually entail. Let's say it will be a little surprising and it's not necessarily the way that it's been applied over these years, over all the centuries. And I would also suggest that in spite of all of our advancements, that the mandate to care and steward the earth, steward the earth, has never changed. And it's something that we are to continue to do, even to this day. Fourth, fourth idea, people care. In permaculture, there's three generalized ideas that kind of set up the, the structure. There's earth care, there's people care, and there's future care. These are all important aspects of permaculture. As Christians, our greatest strength lies within people care. It is something that we have been doing for 2,000 years. It's something that we continue to do, and we will continue to do throughout our history. It is something that we were created for once we were redeemed by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is our purpose. So because it, can, because it is what we are good at, I think it fits well into a permaculture structure, but with this idea of it's, it's ruled by Christian principles. Now, the fifth reason or fifth idea is that we need a place to discuss amongst one another our ideas about how the Bible uh, describes or uses uh, agricultural, ecological, uh, principles we need a place to discuss these things we need a place to discuss the, where we can form our ideas we don't want to remove ourselves away from interacting within other you know permaculture or other ecological or other sustainable agriculture forums or, or, or you know pages or whichever way I mean, even uh, conventions and things like that. We, we do want to uh, interact and, and, uh, and participate in those things. Because I believe that we have an important role to play. We have an important place within this context. But we also need a place where we can discuss our ideas and, and, and hash them out amongst one another. And unfortunately, a lot of times, a mention of, especially the God of the Bible, or especially the Christian God, within the context of many ecological or agricultural or even permaculture uh, groups, tends to be met with a certain amount of demeaning and hostility. And, and that's, to be honest, it's fine. I mean, it's we think about our Savior, and he was demeaned too. But also at the same sense, he spent time alone with his disciples, discussing, teaching them of a lot of different things. And so, you know, it is not wrong for us to, to take a little bit of time and discuss these things amongst one another. Also, uh, number six, number six, Permaculture, in many ways, is, is really compatible with uh, a Christian view of ecology and agriculture, at least in, in general practice. In its most simplistic form, what it wants, what it, what it seeks to do, permaculture, is to create a permanent culture in which there are limited inputs and, and by or through which nature pretty much just does what it's going to do. The way we should see this is that God created everything in such a manner that it can 
act together, which is called biodiversity or biointeraction, I guess. But God created it that way. God in his wisdom created things like the uh, blister beetle to take care of the grasshopper population. A few couple of years ago, we had an infestation of grasshoppers. Next year, we had an infestation of blister beetles. The year after that, we had grasshoppers, but not an infestation, and we had very little blister beetles because the blister beetles naturally like to, one of their, one of their main prey is the grasshopper. So you see the natural order work together. This happens with pollination, and it happens with planting things like tree guilds or support species with our plants, companion planting. I mean, there's a lot of different aspects to this, but also the use of perennials in which there is this continual propagation of, uh, of, 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 of plants, you know, so whether it's, you know, something that is truly perennial, like an asparagus that'll come up again and again and again over a long period of time, or it's something that may be a biennial, like a tatsoi or uh, a kale uh, or mustards that'll flower, you know, and then seed and then they'll come back up again. Um, it's really trying to find where there's not a lot of aggressive aspects in which there are inputs, so many inputs to gain output that were beneficial to our existence. It is acting in concert with nature. I think, I think that fits very well, especially later on as we study the Genesis chapter 1 and 2 narrative. I think we'll see this fits together quite beautifully. Now, number seven. Personally, in my estimation, stewardship of the earth is our... Uh, golden key to making disciples of the next generation, of bringing the gospel into the next generation. Our children have been trained to have a, uh, a love and respect for the earth. They are, they are very concerned about the created order. And I think that's something that we as Christians have actually missed a lot of just generally speaking of a Christian population, I've seen a lot of people start to awaken that there is something that we need to do, that constant exploitation of the Earth's resources without replacement and replenishment is futile, and it's only, it's doing more harm than it is good. But our children are deeply concerned about this, and we're just not talking about it in the church. I was talking to a friend the other day, and he just says, I just, don't, I just don't see what you're talking about. Nobody's talking about it. And I said to him, I said, and that's why this is one of the biggest problems that we face and why our young generation is leaving the church and why they're not being reached by the gospel because we are ignoring something that actually is described within the pages of the Bible, something that is precious to God that he gave us to take care of and we are not doing it and because of that we're not and we're not talking about it we are losing the next generation see we're supposed to be a people of redemption we love a good redemption story maybe we need to also focus our redemption story on attempting to preserve the earth as long as we possibly can. We know that scripturally it says one day that it'll burn in a fervent heat, but it is a question mark as to when that will come. We have no idea when that point in time will actually come. You see, throughout church history, there always has been an apocalypse on the horizon. And even though today it may seem like the, the apocalypse may be on the horizon, we have to be careful that we don't ignore the very things that sustain us in the meantime. Because what if the apocalypse, what if the end of days, what if the, you know, for some that believe in it, the pre-trib rapture of the church, 
is still 50, 100, 200, 1,000 years away. We not only need to be thinking about that future aspect, because it does help order our life today, but we also need to think about the ramifications of how we live today. And that's why thinking about ecology and agriculture, sustainable agriculture, permaculture from a Christian perspective, I think are much needed and are a great opportunity to reach the next generation for Christ in order that he could be made known as he is known by them and by us. And the final eighth aspect, that eighth idea, is very simply, the whole story begins in a garden. It's agricultural. It's interacting with the creation that God gave us. And within that context, interacting with God as well. It provides us, by the way, being in tune with you know, agriculture and ecology, being uh, in tune with the created order around us, actually can heighten our sensitivity and our awareness of God because within these contexts, a lot of the distractions tend to be pushed down and out of, out of the way. But we can maybe start to hear God clearly again. But it don't, not only starts in the garden in Genesis 1 and 2, the culmination after everything happens in the book of Revelation, what is one of the first things we see in the final scene? Two trees whose, who bear their fruit. One is for the healing of the nations. One is bearing its fruit each and every season. It's like a multi-grafted tree, 12 fruits from one tree, and a river running between them. We see it starts in a garden, it ends in a garden, and we need to be more mindful of those. And I didn't, you know, I wasn't thinking about this, but, you know, maybe a bonus, a nine or a bonus, is it just makes sense in the times that we live. To start to look at uh, things through, especially agriculture, ecology, uh, permaculture through a Christian lens, because it may be our saving grace if food and resources become scarce where we can live off a little piece of, of land live or even learn about wild edibles and how to survive out in the wild we don't know all that tomorrow entails and we need to make preparations now and from the time that the bible started in genesis 1 and 2 and the bible ends in Revelation 22. There's a garden involved. Maybe there's a lesson for us there. I'm excited to see that some of my friends are putting in uh, different types of plants in order that they could have some food, even in places that are not as hospitable to growing food. A friend who, in a mission that he started in Hermosillo, Mexico, is putting in grapes and he has mulberries and he's trying to do a few different things that would be uh, beneficial and helpful to um, providing food. And there are others that, you know, have started home gardens by growing, you know, tomato plants or two cucumbers, some beans, some have a little more land and actually do farmer's markets and things like that. Um, whatever it is, it is also a very Christian thing to do, to interact with God's creation. It's something we should be doing all the time. It's, it should be an essential part of who we are and our care for the earth is just another way of showing the people of the world that God is a great God 
who is worthy of being praised, glorified, and trusted in all things. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. And may he bring you peace. May he fill you and sustain you in all things. God bless you. Love them.